uh, we're now live streaming on YouTube. So this is the official start of our meeting. This is the continuation of the Appropriations Committee morning meeting. And we're continuing now with the schedule at 11.30 for the Department um, of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living. So uh, we have Commissioner Hutt with us and I, I'm assuming you brought some sort of a team. I'm looking around my Hollywood Squares commissioner to see who you have brought with you. Um, I I believe that me I know that Megan Tierney Ward is on the line. Okay. I thought I I thought I saw I hope I saw Bill Kelly, but I'm not seeing him now. I'm not seeing him either. He may be joining us. He may have got kicked off. Sometimes people get kicked off. And Bill, Bill Kelly. Oh, I see Bill Kelly. I see Bill Kelly. He's at the very bottom. The screen just isn't on. No, I don't have him. Do we have a page? He's at the very bottom. No, he's on page two. That's why. There you are, Bill. Thank there you. he is. <laughs> there there's um, pages. Thank you. And of course, Sarah Clark is here as well from the agency. Thank you, Sarah, for joining us as well. So uh, we have, uh, this is going to be uh, a joint meeting with the, the House Human Services Committee. Welcome back. We had you yesterday, Representative Pugh. Um, you and your committee, we're glad that you're here so that we're all on the same page more quickly. Just as a reminder, the information we're going to see is the changes from the governor's 2020 proposal from January. And so we're not going to see the entire proposal. Those are still on the table as was presented in January and February. However, these are the changes that they're recommending from that. So um, we are getting to um, committees, uh, the list of 2020, the list of the uh, quarter budget, and then the list of the Delta. And the Delta can be from the January proposal and also from the quarter budget. So there's a lot of moving pieces here. And uh, we're looking for recommendations um, from the policy committees by the 1st or 2nd of September, which is not very far out, but we'll manage to get it done together. And um, I wanted to tell the policy committee that on Monday at 10 o'clock, House Appropriations will be walking through all of the language and we will see the entire packet of language, what was proposed in January, what has been deleted or delayed from January, what changes have been made from January. So if anyone wants to jump in, be in touch with Teresa or jump in on the, on the uh, YouTube uh, video and um, you, you can hear the language. You're not gonna wanna listen to all of it, but um, you're more than welcome uh, to hop on and off and, and catch the pieces that are related. So um, until uh, 12 o'clock and we have the commissioner here. And so I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Hutt and uh, we can walk through um, the changes to the 2020 proposed, proposed uh, 21 proposal in January. Oh, great. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much, Representative Toll. Um, and I see that Teresa has shared her screen. So um, as, as is typical for Dale, we, uh, tend to put, we always put our budget into this sort of a narrative so that we can walk through the numbers. The numbers that you'll start to see um, correspond to the ups and downs. They're just easier to look at in this format, um, but just so that you know that they, they do correspond. Teresa, would you mind scrolling all the way down to page three? Because I think most of this information, both House Human Services and House Appropriations is really familiar with. Thank you so much. Um, it's incredibly hard for me not to have control of that movement. So <laughs> I'll try not to keep flinching. Um, thanks all to, for having us in. Uh, what you're going to see here at, as uh, Chairwoman Toll stated um, is the restatement budget. So the changes from the FY21. This very first section of, of the document summarizes all of the changes across all of the appropriations in Dale. So this very first section is a summary. Um, I won't dwell here, but I'll go right into the different appropriations. But just so you know that that's there. And as you can see on that summary, the, the gross change, uh, gross dollars change is about $309,000. So I'm looking for the 309. Where, at, the, at the very top of that document. Okay, thank you, thank you. 
Sure. So um, thank you, Teresa. So uh, so for Dale administration, um, there were a few things that we did to try to manage um, the situation that we have in front of us with uh, the reductions in revenue and, and um, the pressure on the state. Uh, so for Dale, we elected to increase our vacancy savings. Uh, this amount brings our percentage of vacancy savings to about 3.25, which is still a pretty reasonable um, amount. We had worked hard over the last few years to reduce that altogether. Um, but this just, this has enabled us to, to utilize this as a way of, of managing the pressure that we're seeing as a department. Um, and those vacancy savings are being achieved really just through uh, the hiring freeze that exists across state government right now, slowing down some of our recruitment, um, but we're not at this moment in time reducing any positions. Commissioner, may I ask uh, just a clarifying question? Are, were you given a 3% target on top of, you were not given a 3% target? No, 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 no. The whole exercise was just um, related to uh, reductions that we needed to try to achieve um, obviously, just to address the budget situation across the state, this was just this. I'm just giving you the three percent as the to let you know where what it stands at for Dale. What this vacancy you savings given, you rates. were given a three percent. I'm sorry. You were given a three percent target to find in reductions. In to in total. Yes. Was your department asked to find three percent uh, three percent savings? off the governor's proposed budget from January? I, uh, Bill, was it 3% that we were targeting? This is Sarah Clark, if I, if I may, kind of typical with any budget exercise, we are issued a target to start with. In this case, it was actually a 5% reduction target. But remember that was kind of well in advance of when we knew what the revenue picture actually was going to be. So we started there and then it's iterative, iterative at the agency and then working with finance and management to the budget that you see before you today. Okay. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, so the next reduction in the administration appropriation is a decrease to the internal service funds allocations that we have. So those include, you know, the costs for uh, agency of digital services, human resources. Um, so those were given to us across the board. Um, and then we added in a travel reduction. Again, pretty reasonable considering the amount of telework that's happening right now. Um, I don't think that this would be a hard um, target to hit within Dale as a department. So our committee is very uh, familiar with the um, internal service fund uh, allocation reductions. We're understanding about travel. Are there any questions on these three reductions for Dale administration from um, either members of either committee? Uh, Representative Pugh. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Monica, in terms of the increase in, sorry, Commissioner, uh, in the increase to vacancy savings, whether it's through attrition or retirement, um, I am struck by the fact that um, the population that your agency um, addresses is, the, as, as we relate to COVID, one of the most vulnerable. And so um, I am wondering where these vacancy savings are as we talk about um, uh, abuse and we talk about elder abuse, as we talk about visiting um, uh, congregate care uh, settings um, for both um, elders and people with disabilities. And so um, I'm wondering where those vacancies are and how that is impacting the work um, that the state is supposed to be doing in protecting people with disabilities and people and um, older Vermonters. Thanks for the question. I think what's um, the positive about this is that we are not decreasing any positions here. The intent is to try to achieve these vacancy savings through just slowing down a hiring process. So no positions are being reduced in this proposal at all. It's just a slower hiring process that's proposed. Typically in Dale, most of our positions and our vacancies, we have about uh, little, 279, 280 total positions. Our vacancies tend to be um, generally in vocational rehabilitation. That seems to be where we see most of the churn um, and so again, it's not uh, necessarily um, reductions 
to uh, any positions. Some good news that we do um, have is that we did get permission um, to maintain uh, our surveyors as a class. So to hire those surveyors as a class, considering the pressure that we have on our nursing facilities right now, our long-term care facilities. So the surveyors, we did receive blanket permission to hire. Um, so there will not be delays in that particular class of employees. Does that answer the question for you? Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Representative Pugh. Uh, Representative Wood and Representative McVaughn. Thank you, um, Representative Toll. Um, Commissioner, uh, just following up on um, the nurse surveyors uh, and long-term care facilities and the decrease in um, travel, uh, are nurse surveyors um, continuing to do in-person site visits at our long-term care facilities? They are. There was a gap in that um, per CMS regulations for a period of time, but those have restarted, and so that is happening right now. Um, thank you. Uh, I just want to, uh, you know, say that the the longer it goes on for there not being uh, outside visitation allowed, and I, I realize the secretary was making some sort of statement about that as I was coming online here, but. Um, uh, when we have insulated facilities that don't have any outside uh, eyes on, um, it causes me concern in any kind of facility type, um, you know, e people trying their best and doing their best, but um, it, it is when there are no outside eyes on that bad things start to happen, and I just um, am anxious about that. I, absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. It's important to remember that the surveyors don't necessarily fall into those visitor restrictions that the secretary might be speaking to. You know, the nursing homes are in phases and as they move through their phases, they're enabled to uh, and allow for more visitation. But the surveyors, if they needed to be in there, even at the height of the epidemic, um, and even when there were outbreaks, they were moving into facilities when they needed to be there. So th that wasn't curtailed, um, but it was based on uh, a real need to be in there. So not necessarily, although even now the more quality level surveys have restarted for a period, that's what was, um, that was what was suspended, but looking at harm or risk of harm continued regardless of the epidemic. And commissioner, as a follow-up to that um, comment, um, have you well, seen, uh, what does the data show in terms of the um, number of um, reports uh, have you seen a steady, uh, you know, roughly the same as what you saw pre-COVID? Uh, has, has it increased? Um, do you have is, any data uh, on that? Uh, there's a little bit of feedback, but is, uh, uh, is everyone's saying, or did anybody know about this until you saw it? James, can you, Representative Gregoire, can you uh, mute your iPhone? Uh, so, uh, Representative Wood, that's a great question in terms of the reports from facilities. I don't have that information off the top of my head, but we can find that out for you. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we had Representative McFawn. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I would like to know if, um, with all the problems at this point in time, that autistic uh, kids are facing with the, the situation in the school the way it is, the changes and you know, you know the kinds of things that disturb autistic children. Um, this decreased uh, in internal services funds, is that where that money would come from to, to work with these kids in terms of the caregiving? No, no, Representative McFawn, it, that, no, absolutely not. Where, where does that come from? I, I, those are, um, Topper, those are the uh, dollars for, for like fee for space from the building and general services and from ADS for computer for IT charges. Okay, all right. All of those so, um, internal okay, charges. Okay, so all, 
I'll wait on the answer to that question and uh, so I get to the right section. Yep, okay, thank you. Thank you, Representative. I don't see any other questions on this section, so I think we can move to the next unless you have anything else to offer, um, Commissioner. No, I'm happy to move down. Um, so thank you so much. So the next appropriation is under the Dale Grants, um, and you'll see two reductions here. Um, part of our Dale Grants um, is the Medicaid Attendant Services Program, um, and we are proposing here a $100,000 underutilization reduction in that Medicaid Attendant Services Program. Um, so that uh, is does still leave us with some headroom. We are trying to be very, very careful of that. Although, as always, any reduction you know decreases that headroom a little bit, but we are feeling confident that that will, will um, be sufficient for the coming year. The second decrease that you see is a $250,000 reduction in the adult day programs. As most, as all of you know, adult day programs closed down in March, early, mid-March um, due to COVID-19. We have been able to um, offset their losses through the coronavirus relief fund from July through September. So uh, this is a reduction that we think is easily achieved. Um, it will not harm them at all. They're, they've got full operating expenses through till the end of September. And I want to highlight, you, you have written that's a one time, so it's not a full, it's not a base reduction into 2022. Correct. Offset by the CRF dollars. Exactly. We have two questions here. Uh, first, Representative Lanfer and then Representative Wood. Great, uh, thank you. It's nice to hear your voice, Commissioner. <laughs> you too. <laughs> so when we're looking at this, variety of space, which I'm glad that my desk is a little bigger than I'm looking at the January, looking at the new restatement and your statement. When I went in this area on the attendant care services in January, there was a um, recommendation of 181,000 reduction in general fund, but nothing in no reduction on that line for global commitment. So this $100,000 reduction is on top of that correct and it's out of global commitment which will have a little bit of jf in it but so if i was to take this in its totality this section is down 281,933 you're speaking I'm, you're speaking just to the general fund representative lamphere well the, the if i look across that line so when i take the $100,000 here from the global commitment and the 181 that was recommended out of the general fund in January, um, it's it, that section is really it's it's a 281, which I don't think anybody disputes. This program has been frozen since 2014, and so it's been seeing seeing the reduction. I just want to make sure I've got my numbers lined up correct. Um, so just to clarify, and I apologize, I realize I know everyone's working on multiple pages yeah. and multiple budgets. Um, this is the Medicaid program, not the general fund program. So the general fund program in attendant services has been frozen. This is the Medicaid program. Um, it is Thank true, you. and you are accurate in that the FY21 budget also proposed a reduction, um, an underutilization reduction in the Medicaid attendant services program. I don't have, I'm afraid, the, the general fund portion of that. I have the global commitment okay. fund portion of that. So I've got the the, the so, gross numbers. So, um, so they're two different, they're two different. One is, one is the general, okay, that's, that's good to know. And the only other, the other question I have around the adult days is we, you guys have done a really good job of working with them since the closure and, and trying to figure out how, how what the percentage of being able to be open is. And we were very successful in getting them the dollars until September. So I was, I was hoping to maybe see either in here or in the request at the Joint Fiscal Committee for dollars for to offset their closure from um, October, November, in December. Yeah, is there a proposal? Uh, there's not a fully formed proposal at this point in time. We are 
working on that. Megan has been um, taking the lead on the adult day program specifically, recognizing that they are gonna, most will need to have some sort of a census reduction in order to open safely. And we've been working really closely with the association on that. So they have a reopening plan that has been sort of blessed by the Vermont Department of Health, which is how we make sure that all of our planning is, yeah. is accurate and up to snuff. Um, and we are working through, there was, um, in the July, August, and September dollars that were um, that were allocated to them, um, mm -hmm. there there are uh, we believe some additional dollars there, and so we're going to we need to assess that and then work to determine what they might need for a fifty percent census on top of that, right? And we're we're just not there yet because they are literally just starting to to grind back open essentially. Right, right. And I just know the timing because at that September end, I was kind of, do you, do you anticipate, and I'll end with that, um, that before we get to the final budget here in September that you'll, you'll come back with or someone will come back with that dollar amount that's going to be needed to see them through to the end of the year? Or yeah. however time frame, yeah. I think absolutely an assessment of what they will need through the end of the year, and then we can determine um, if that turns into a request. It may be that we are already there, depending on what right. the actual needs are. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Diane. I have a question from Representative Wood and then uh, Representative Hooper. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my question is reg with regard to the adult day. Um, services as well. And as, um, as you all know, uh, we've had two, I think two, maybe more now, but uh, two that I'm aware of um, close. And so I'm just wondering what planning the department is doing to try to um, make those services again accessible to people in those two parts of the state that now have lost them. And, and I'm just wondering, since this is a one-time uh, a one-time decrease, um, you know, whether we should be looking at that one-time funding that's available to try to jumpstart uh, two new programs in those areas. Um, so I can certainly speak to the planning component. It's interesting and obviously um, unexpected to have to close at the same time. Um, and it's not something that there's any precedent for within the department. Um, so we are working actively with the area agencies on aging. There are two different area agencies on aging that are impacted, one in the Rutland area, one in the Barry area to uh, consider sort of the options and the plans and who might be interested. We've had multiple conversations with entities. I don't wanna sort of name names at this point in time because there have been a couple of entities that have approached us and indicated their interest. I think that there are some opportunities for some collaboration in those communities across a couple of different entities um, that are interested in restarting the adult day programs. Um, there is certainly a need to um, consider the payment structure for adult day programs, I think, going into the future. And I have actually been out uh, most of this week, but I know that uh, Angela Smith Jang, who's the director of our adult services division, sat in on a national call around adult day programs just globally because there's not every other state is experiencing the exact same thing. Services are really necessary, um, and I think we've been able to be really creative with them in terms of how they're delivering some of their services. But the bottom line is that they're very much an in-person service, and that's really what's required. Um, and so trying to understand how that continues into the future, seeing the, the vulnerability that we have to virus like COVID, but even other viruses as they may come along, has been kind of a national conversation. So very long answer to your question. Um, we certainly are working with both communities to try to establish if there are providers that are interested in um, rebuilding and rebeginning the adult services um, and working with the association more globally. Uh, in terms of the, the one-time startup, that's honestly not something that I had thought about. Um, so I'm not sure that I can speak to that representative, Wood. Uh, can, can I ask the question, um, I, I guess maybe a, an adjunct to that question. So if you if there's 250,000 that's been identified as 
one time because CRF is offsetting. Uh, is there headroom, as you spoke to in the attendant services program, is there additional headroom there uh, on that side of uh, global commitments in order to be able to, I'm just wondering if there's any flexibility there because I, you know, it's obviously a very needed service and if we have some flexibility to assist with startup of two new programs, that would be something that I think we'd be interested in. I don't know that I can speak to that right now, but that's certainly something we can get back to you on. Okay, and thank you. Sarah Clark, um, from a global commitment headroom perspective, it, it is not an issue. That was what your question was, Representative Wood, I believe. It is not an issue, meaning that there is additional headroom. Yes. Thank you. And then I just wanted to follow up to make sure I'm following along with this, that we do have this one time uh, decrease due to the CRF offset. There may be headroom with the global commitment. However, the GF portion, if we're starting something up and it only needs startup money, that's, that's one consideration. But if it's ongoing, we're using an awful lot of uh, one-time money to keep existing programs um, uh, going into 2022 so that we don't make unnecessary reductions, not knowing what the future is going to look like. But if we know we're putting one-time money into starting something new, we may not have the general fund. It's not looking like we're going to have any extra general fund. We're going to be looking at probably reductions in 22 to start it up and not be able to um, uh, fund it in 22, or unless we fund, didn't fund something else. I guess that's right. Rep Representative, Representative Toll, I think that what I'm referring to is the um, the money that you know theoretically has now been freed up because we have had the closure of two programs that were existing prior. So it, it wouldn't be new money. It wouldn't be additional new global commitment or new general fund. I'm still talking about working within the parameters that the department has had. Okay, um, but I, I think then they would have to find the reduction somewhere else in their budget because they have used those closings um, to, to balance this budget. Is that correct, Sarah? Or Monica? Yes. Well, what, what we're proposing to use here, I'm sorry, Monica. No, that's okay. <laughs> is the one-time savings that are freed up because we're paying for the operating costs for adult days using coronavirus relief fund in the first quarter of state fiscal year 21. That is what is included here as one-time savings. So that is the, that's a different savings. So from the closing of the two adult days, where have those ongoing savings gone? Just into the bottom line? So adult days are funded both through day health rehab and direct Medicaid billing, and they're also funded as part of our Choices for Care program. They have, there are kind of multiple funding sources that go into adult day programs. So you would see a little bit of um, headroom potentially in our Choices for Care program, although when we get to that appropriation, you'll see that um, we're actually asking for an increase in that caseload because we're seeing some increases there, some increase in need there. So I don't, it, it is tight. I mean, I think that the point that you're trying to make, Madam Chair, is that it's a, it's a tight budget for sure. Um, certainly in Choices for Care, that is true. Um, I think that the idea of one-time startup just kind of for operational things is a little bit challenging only because I'm not sure that that can actually be Medicaid because it's, it's probably more of a bricks and mortar kind of a startup. Um, but if we had two new programs operating, um, if they could get up and running on their own and be operating, that is certainly already part of our vision and our package. Um, and so we would anticipate being able to support those replacement programs startup costs that are one time that are more bricks and mortar might become more challenging just because I'm not sure that that can be Medicaid. Thank you. Um, so this conversation will continue with the policy committee. Also, Diane, you'll be part of that, that conversation about the two that have closed. Um, the possibility of getting anything in place, uh, you know, in this, in this budget and then where, what, what funding implications that would have. Um, let's see, do I have um, any other questions from, uh, let's move on to page four. We see that um, 
uh, the department of those were not uh, adjusted. So let's go to developmental services. Thank you. Yes, so thank you so much. So in developmental services, what you will see is a budget to actuals adjustment. Um, this doesn't represent any service reductions or provider reductions or impact to individuals. It's a, it's a um, result of the way in which we fund developmental services. Um, so that's pretty straightforward, I think. Are there any questions on the DS? Yes, we do have a uh, topper. Uh, Representative McFawn, please. Is, is this where my question about uh, the autistic children would come in? So um, potentially, um, I think when you're talking about services in schools for children that are on the autism spectrum, that's typically in the success beyond six world. And I know that you had Commissioner Squirrel already in to testify and she probably spoke to that. Um, so those are typically school-based services. There are not a lot of children um, as you all well know, on the developmental services caseload, uh, this is primarily an adult caseload, but we, we, we do have some, but not very many. So most of those school-based services are happening through Success Beyond Six um, and partnership with the schools and- um, the So that's where the socialization problem, uh, that caregiving activity would take place? No, I'm sorry. You're, no, school. I thought you were talking about school based services. My apologies. In terms of support for families, um, that, right. So, um, that those supports are built into the developmental services budget. This reduction doesn't impact those supports. Those are based on individual service plans and individual budgets. Certainly, it has been challenging through the pandemic to get those services to kids. Um, and part of what we've been able to do um, over the last few months is to authorize crisis payments to families, um, to enable them to convert some of the dollars that are available through their service plans so that they can um, utilize those dollars um, in some other way or to pay family members to get that kind of respite. But I think that the lack of school um, and, the, and the very slow restart of community-based supports for kids has certainly put an impact on families. But those services in, from developmental services agencies are restarting right now. Um, in fact, they had a deadline of uh, August 15th to, to sort of rebegin billing appropriately for that. And so we should start to see those ramping back up. Okay, so Commissioner, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is I've, I've, I've been talking to people who have autistic children and um, the problems they're having is the changes that are taking place in terms of how the education system is, is being changed for these kids and the anxiety that's developing in them. And um, then you say now the, the designated agency type services are ramping up. My question is, do we need more help for them? Do you I think understand it's, what I mean? I do, it's a really fair question. Um, one of the conversations that we've just started to have is with the Agency of Education because we're really concerned that there are appropriate accommodations for kids with disabilities, not, not only on the autism spectrum, but just globally, that there are appropriate accommodations as schools are creating this sort of hybrid model. Um, what are the accommodations for those students with disabilities? And I think that that is a conversation that we need to have with um, agency of education. You know, I, I don't, I'm not at all trying to, to pass the buck, but I do think that we need to consider how the ed fund factors into this as well, because this is, these are the school services are the pieces that are being impacted. And I really wanna understand how that's working for kids with disabilities specifically. I'm not sure that we have, you know, available dollars in our budget I know that we don't have available dollars in our budget to supplant what education has been providing. I think that we need to think about how to partner with them effectively to make sure that there's a full component of services and accommodations to make sure that kids can still get their educational needs met. I, I think this is, I, I appreciate that. I think it's very important. I know what's happening in the school system that I represent. <clears throat> and 
they have one room <clears throat> where, where if something happens during the day, these kids gonna go. Now that's not adequate. We all know that because it's not gonna be just one kid that's having a problem with these changes. So, okay, I'm glad that I'm glad to hear. I, I think that's an extremely important um, uh, effort on your part to make sure that, that that happens because these kids are in trouble. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Representative McFawn. Um, we have Representative Yakavoni, Lamper, and Wood. And we are over our time, and I'm I'm fine with being over the time. I'm just hoping that uh, Monica, you have you have a few more minutes. That um, okay? Of course. Uh, Dave. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, my question on the developmental services adjustment, the 1.6 million, uh, is that an adjustment because in FY20, the program underspent? Can you just help me understand it? I'm gonna, I can, and I'm actually maybe gonna pass the baton over to Bill because this was not necessarily because of underspending. This is that the cash accrual that is created in developmental services because of the way that it's funded. Bill, do you want to jump in? He I, know he's, I know he's here. <laughs> I know he's here. Uh, Bill, Art, you may have to unmute yourself. I'm looking to see. I, there you are. I see you talking, but we're not hearing you. Teresa, call, um, tech help. <laughs> he's been muzzled you know bill can you call in by phone please do you have the number and um if you could call in by phone that would he's be helpful not, he's not muted so i think it's on it's on his end so did you accidentally mute the um can you go in the system tray down in the right hand side if you're in a computer and look for the little um what it looks like a speaker, a little speaker. Can you, you can wrong side click on it and, or if you have speakers there, turn them on or nothing. Is your volume all the way down? All right, so um, yeah, it's something on the computer. So uh, Bill, if you look at the, um, the invitation that you got in your calendar, there's a phone number. And if you want to, use that to call in you can leave your face on the screen and call for so we're going to wait for bill to call in but i'm going to move to uh, representative lamper's uh question and go back to yours dave in the you know, to save time here absolutely you bet yes. diane the very first number that you see in the invitation do you need me to send it again okay we're going to go ahead teresa uh, uh representative lamper Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I know that we're running short of time. So I think my, my question is very much in, in line with where, where Representative um, Yacovoni was going. So on the 1.6 here, this is in addition to the 3.4 in January, correct? Correct. Um, okay. So, and those were just, those were in January, though, those were also budget to adjustment. You know, and in January, we'll have to keep in mind that we also had a $6.5 million up and a $1.1 million up in the other. And then this was a, this was not a service reduction. I was wondering on this 1.6, and I don't know if you can answer this, but it's something was like this, I'm was concerned that the stay at home or um, kind of orders of staying in and what that did to people's budgets for um, this community not being able to to access the full opportunity of their of their service budgets, or was this strictly you know I'm I'm just thinking was there savings within budgets because they couldn't access it or this was just bills accounting. So this is not related to any lack of service delivery that happened because of the crisis, and it's not. Um, it is. It doesn't represent um, an overage in our funding or or caseload. This is really an artifact of the way that we accrue dollars, and it's which is unique to developmental services, which is really why I wanted Bill to, 
to be able to explain that. And I believe he is on now. So Bill, if you make sure that your computer is now off so that we're not looping, uh, we could listen, we could hear you by phone. I think he's okay. He, we can see him and he can talk on the phone at the okay. same time. Okay, perfect. Can Bill? you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes. So, so the appropriation is built on uh, everyone's individual waiver that's approved um, on an accrual basis. So if a certain percentage, 30% of the consumers come in, say in the last quarter of the, the year, they're obviously not gonna have a full year of expense. So the appropriation's been built like they would spend on a cash basis, the full amount by June 30th, and that's just clearly not the case. So that's what this budget to actuals adjustment is. Okay. Thank, thank you, Bill, but nobody, I'm, I'm just wondering like the individual budget. So if somebody, this isn't just saying, oh, you had a thousand dollars in your budget and, um, but because you didn't, I don't know, partake of some sort of community service because of stay at home, you were, re, you know, there was a two hundred dollar no. unused portion. Yeah. That doesn't mean their base budget there's, next year will change, but, but there's no. okay. There's there's clearly no reduction to any consumer or to the DA. Okay, that's that's what we really need to know. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative. Uh, let's go back to Representative um, Yacovoni. I'm okay. I'm listening. Thank you. You're good. You're good, Dave. Y yes, I am. Yep. Okay, Representative. Thank you. Uh, that, that this was along my line of questioning as well. So I'm 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 not good, but I'm okay. <laughs> so the 1.6 and the three <laughs> from January does not reflect any. Uh, any reductions to uh, services or to individuals who receive services? No. Correct. Okay. Um, let's continue then to the next, uh, to uh, TBI, please. Um, so again, there's a, obviously a theme throughout the entire presentation here. This is another underutilization adjustment in the traumatic brain injury program. Um, it is on top of a proposed reduction in the FY21 budget as well. Um, it does leave us with a little bit of headroom still and, um, and just looking back at past budgets for the TBI program, we are confident that this will, will be sufficient. Um, again, remember that the TBI program is designed to be rehab. It's very um, unpredictable how many people come in and what we've done over the last several years at this point in time is for those long-term needs in TBI, they shift into our Choices for Care program as necessary. So this is really um, a very short-term rehab component program, which I think is um, appropriate. Monica, can you remind us of the amount in January of the underutilization dollar? Or Diane, I bet you have it right at your fingertip. I, I do, Madam Chair. I take So it was a BAA? In, in January, it was a $285,000 for, for customers, but that was that was actually a BAA item. BAA and not in the governor's proposal. Right. Thank you. I had actually forgotten that. Thank you, Representative Lampier. You're welcome. Um, uh, if I don't see, I do not see any uh, TBI questions. Uh, let's move to choices for care, please. Uh, so this is the one spot where there is a requested increase. Um, choices for care, our caseload is built on a three-year average caseload build. Um, essentially, the estimate that we had for FY21 is just too low. Um, our actuals in this program are demonstrating not only a, a, a slightly higher caseload amount, but a higher cost per case amount. Um, and so this is an adjustment to that particular budget. Are there questions about the increase um, for choices for care for home and community-based uh, activities? Uh, Representative Wood. Sorry, almost lost my iPad. <laughs> um, 
Commissioner, uh, can you tell me um, what portion of that uh, is community-based services versus nursing facility services? Uh, I can't off the top of my head. I'm not sure that we, Bill, do we have that broken down like that? Um, well, I, I'm not sure this is exactly what's being asked, but from my perspective, it's all home and community based. So I'm not sure. So, so it's not a nursing home, it's all home and home. no. If it's all home and community based, then uh, that does answer my question. I just didn't know if it, because Choices for Care also includes nursing facility, and I didn't know if we were seeing. Uh, uh, yes, I'm, cost there. I'm sorry, I, mi I didn't understand what you were asking, and Bill's accurate. Yes, this is all home and community based services. So, yeah, although nursing homes are are part of the overall. Um, appropriation. Um, we typically look for those de increases and decreases separately as we have in the past. So this is all HCBS. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Teresa, if you, if I could just add, it, it's also the enhanced residential care. So on the crosswalk, it says home and community-based services and enhanced residential care. So what would not be in here, and you can tell me, is the ACCCD or something a, the ACCS, which is actually part of the DIVA budget, that's the state Medicaid payment for our residential care facilities, but the enhanced residential care, so that additional yes. money on top of that for folks in the Choices for Care program is a part of this HCBS, yes. Thank you. So at this time, because we, we're significantly over, but it's important that we complete our work and, and we know the direction we're traveling, uh, Representative Pugh um, has up that let's take some time right now to um, review the or to re, in order to know what our next steps are what additional information does the member need at this time to make decisions on this budget and I, I do believe uh, there are questions about the adult days with the two closing and whether uh, two more could be open with with um, with the uh, money from the two that have closed so that would be an ongoing discussion. Are there any, are there any other um, open questions that, that people need more clarification on that has to do with the Dale budget? Um, My only would be the CFR dollars if there's gonna be needed, if there's more and how would they, are there planned to bring them in? Uh, CFR dollars would have been reflected here if the governor had, um, uh, he combined his CRF dollars with the with the 21 budget. So I'm assuming there's no additional CRF dollars since they're not reflected here. Is that accurate, Sarah? Yes, as is currently contemplated. Okay. But I think Representative Lanfear, you were talking about a potential proposal to fund the adult days for this okay. second quarter. That's is an that ongoing really conversation. Okay, CRF for adult days. Okay. And any other, uh, Representative McFawn? Yes, I think, I think it's still an open question about uh, the Department of Education and Dale getting together for, uh, to deal with the problems that are arising with those autistic kids. And so um, if, if that is language that, that would request that the two committees work together, um, Anne, is that something that your committee within See, would, would connect with education and work on possible language if it's needed? Um, yes, although it might be more, I believe that healthcare somehow deals with um, autism. I'm not sure. Children's personal care. What? Is Mary, Mary, Mary's waving her hand. Care. I think she has an answer. Go ahead, Mary. Um, if this is a success beyond six question, it's a Department of Mental Health, thus Healthcare Committee, and AOE question. And it has been raised with when when we were meeting with the Healthcare Committee and DMH, we raised this issue. Um, did not ask specifically about autistic kids, but we certainly have been having a conversation about services provided to children via the success beyond six. 
So Topper, um, if I may, um, uh, so Topper, this is not something that human services and appropriations would be dealing with in terms of language. This is something for you to connect with um, Representative Lippert or Representative Donahue um, in terms of healthcare. Um, and if you want, I can help you write an email to them and to the chair of education and put the three, put the, put you all together. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ann, for that assistance and Topper. It's an important, um, it's an important question. So I, I look forward to getting resolution to it. It's, it's in every community, um, these services to kids that, that there's an impact. Representative Wood. Um, thank you, um, Chair Toll. Um, Commissioner, um, I would be interested in additional information um, regarding the, uh, the DS cut and um, how that might impact um, one-time allocations going out to designated agencies. And then my second question is, um, at your presentation last week, to joint fiscal uh, on Meals on Wheels, you said um, that there was potentially a second request coming. And so we didn't see anything in your budget for CRF funds for Meals on Wheels for another request. So I'm just wondering, is there one coming or or not? Um, so I can, oh, is, should I answer both questions? Well, that, that, I'm just, that's for additional information that we need, I guess. Okay, I, I will let you know that it won't, the uh, DS reduction won't impact the one-time dollars that go out to designated agencies. Um, I'm sorry, am I, I, I'm, I'm still misunderstanding. Am I meant to answer or I should just wait and put that in there? No, go, ahead, go ahead with the Meals on Wheels. It, okay, um, so the, there was a nutrition adequacy report that was requested by Joint Fiscal and we submitted on the 18th, I believe. Um, I, I, that's not true. I, it absolutely was submitted on the 18th. That um, indicated that the one need that still existed and at the area agencies on aging was um, if we if we wanted them to continue an increased rate of reimbursement to senior centers and meal sites for the provision of meals that there we estimated about five hundred and sixty five thousand dollars in CRF funds would be necessary for them to continue that till the end of the calendar year. Um, I, as I said, I've been away this week, so I have not um, followed up yet on whether or not we're going to roll that into a request. I, I expected, um, I think, to hear a little bit from Joint Fiscal about how that report was received and if they believe that that was um, a reasonable request to make going forward. Um, because we were putting it into a report and making the recommendation or giving the information, I think I was waiting to hear back from Joint Fiscal. Okay, so, so Madam Chair, Madam Chair, I just ahead. missed that. I guess that's. So you're muted somehow? Click like I'm muted. Oh, okay. you're back. Oh, okay. Um, so um, Madam Chair, I'd say that's an outstanding question for us in terms of what will happen for meals and nutrition programs for seniors. Okay, so, uh, so what I have, I, I have the outstanding questions are uh, the adult day questions with the two closing and whether CRF dollars would be appropriate here. And, and Diane, you'll work with the committee jurisdiction on this, the Meals on Wheels question, um, and we'll, we'll um, We'll connect with the Joint Fiscal Office and, and determine uh, where that is at. And I do not, uh, do we have any other questions? The DAs will not be impacted with the reduction. Um, I'm going to use the word reduction instead of cut. A cut sounds like it goes to a program. A reduction sounds like the ebb and flow of money, uh, depending on um, the number of people utilizing a service. And so they're adjusting uh, to the need without any reductions to any uh, individuals or to the program itself. And so are there any open questions on the DS at this time for this budget? Maybe way into the future or in the 22 budget, but for this budget, uh, are there open questions for DS? 
I'm going to take DS off the table and we're, the two pieces that are left open um, are um, the uh, CRF for adult days and um, the Meals on Wheels. Is that correct? And we don't have any issue um, with the increase to the choices for care. I'm going to take that out. Madam Toll, this is Megan. I have a question I wrote down, um, the number of reports at licensing and protection and whether that has changed. So we'll look into that as well. Okay, thank you. And that's for informational purposes. I'm just, I, I just wanna make sure I don't miss a budget piece. And Diane, you'll do the cross-checking for um, uh, proposals from the, the uh, January proposed budget. Okay, Anne, so does that give you, uh, that gives you some direction, uh, whether we're doing something with adult base and with Meals on Wheels and uh, the other piece we should probably go back and fully review, but not at this point, I'll catch up with you uh, with Kimberly, the DCF budget, because there, there was a lot of moving pieces. There's, there. there's a, thank you. There's a lot with that. And I just um, wanna say to my committee, there's lots of language. Um, there were some, language in the January budget and what I'm understanding from what um, Teresa um, Utten just sent me in terms of gray, uh, the, co the color code. Um, gray means um, it was in the governor's recommendation in January and so that still is a recommendation. And blue is new things. And of the gray, um, some of, uh, and, and some of it has been deleted, but our committee had gone through almost all of the language and had weighed in with the policy committees. So we're going to match up with decisions that we've already made so that we don't have to rehash uh, those decisions again, which we would have made uh, with the policy committees um, uh, knowing. And so many of those areas, we're going to cross check all the, all the language that we had closed off because we had finished up, I think, way close to 98% of the language. So just in terms of the folks on human services, you don't, at, you don't need to spend your weekend looking at the language. We will wait for part B. Well, um, you might want to look at their new language. Right, right, the, the new language. Right, okay. Okay, I think that uh, that closes uh, this and I know that we're a bit over um, and um, nice to see all of you. Thank you, Commissioner, for coming in. Uh, thank you, Healthcare Committee, and we look forward to working together with you and solving this budget um, as expeditiously as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you ready You're to go live? Thank you.